Hello, everyone. This is yet again another episode of To Debate. And I'm Sebastian speaking to you live from somewhere, somewhere, anywhere on this planet, still alive, or maybe it's just my avatar. And I'm also still with the same co host, Dirk. Yes, I'm not going anywhere. I'm also here at the same place. Like you've always. always been in the same place. <laughs> 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 yeah, for, for close to a hundred episodes, people were wondering every time we were in their ears, where is Sebastian this time? And now for, I don't know, the third or fourth ep a recording in a row, you've been in your home office in Switzerland. That's correct. In fact, uh, have you tried this thing? Um, because you can simulate, uh, I guess a lot of people listening to us are are possibly working from home as well. So I suspect that... Uh, they've been using a lot of video conference, but do you know? And I tested this just yesterday with my nephews and my niece, and making them laugh. Let's see. Let's see. I know. I know our listeners can't can't see this, but let's see if this works in a second. All right, you ready? Are you ready? I'm going to transform myself. I'm ready. And this is my baby face. <laughs> <laughs> oh I've just my lost goodness! Twenty-five how, years, haven't I? How 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 uh realistic is it compared to your real baby face i mean did you not look at, at photos realistic. no not at all <laughs> so so for, for our listeners i'm usually using, using a filter right now to transform the video feed that Dirk can see and it can transform my face into a baby face and does not look like my my baby face it's quite realistic in terms of how it makes me look much younger it looks like a baby face yeah the question i'll, I'll show you how i really looked when i was when, when i looked like it when i was a kid I was like this. Yes, this is this is how you look. Definitely me. Definitely you. I I, <laughs> I mean, you almost look like this right now. <laughs> All right, that uh, that is very realistic. What software are you using for this? This is Snap Camera. For those who want to try that, it's actually a software you download from Snapchat. I had no idea, and I saw this the first time when I was having a meeting with our uh, friends in the company in China. So I thought, how did they change their background without using a green screen? And yeah, because they they had like the beach behind them, they had other other backgrounds. And I thought, how do they do this? And of course, it's using like five. You know, your, the fan of your laptop is is screaming because it's probably using it the software and hardware intensely. Um, and I and I looked it up and I found that it was Snap Camera. So if you go to Snapchat or Snap Camera on your favorite search engine, you'll probably find this. It's very easy to use, and it just adds and simulates. Another webcam. So if you're in a in Skype or Hangouts Meet, uh, you can actually change the webcam source in the settings, and it will and you'll select Snap Camera. You need to restart your browser. I got stuck if I did not restart my browser. Mm -hmm. It's fun, you know, with kids once in a while. With colleagues, I'm a bit more careful. But oh well, you, know, the, you never know if they can take a screenshot of your face, you know, and use it against you. The, you never know. I took screenshots of your face just now, so our did listeners you? ever. Yeah, of you? course, I did. Shit, I know I can trust you for that. <laughs> I know, you got you got tricked once. You don't get fooled twice. <laughs> Maybe uh, what we should do for the podcast. Oh no, I, it's 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 a joke. What I'm saying uh, next, but I, I like joking. Obviously, is is to change our voices. You know, since you can change the frequency of our voice and. To make it more diverse, right? We want to have a woman on the podcast, haven't? Don't we? Yeah, we but I prefer I it. prefer a real woman uh, over over just changing the voice. Um, like uh, also, if people listen, it doesn't change anything, does it? <laughs> <laughs> real or not, these days, what is real? What is fake? We already had the debate about fake news. Yeah, yeah, that, right, right. I can I can play Siri if you like. I can have uh, Siri reading my statements to you. That makes definitely for an engaging debate. Do you have any any Siri, Alexa, Google Home at home? No, I don't. No, no. Okay. It's just never. It just never reached the point for me that I actually found it useful. You know, there are so many cases, especially when you're not uh, a native uh, English speaker, when you speak in your local language. There are so many cases where the damn thing would just do a web search, and you just try to have something substantially done. So it's. It becomes so annoying so quickly that you just stop doing it. And that's why I never got past geeking out over it and then not using it. And that, uh, so we don't have any any smart speakers in the house. I know the feeling. Um, the reason I was, um, I was asking that question is because you can configure the type of voice that is speaking out of Google Home. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been 
reason for a fight to choose whether it's a male voice or a female voice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I use the device actually for a, more of a, more as a loudspeaker. So if I listen when I'm now that I'm cooking way more than I used to, uh, especially at dinner, I actually put a podcast on the on the speaker instead of having it from my phone. So I use the Bluetooth. It's just used as a speaker. So that's it. So I've been much more into listening to podcasts. What a surprise. Any recommendations you have to share? Uh, what I've tried lately, uh, it, it really varies. I don't, I'm, I'm not necessarily subscribed to anything. It really depends on my mood. But I do, it's because of you, by the way. I listen a little bit to the daily sometimes from mm -hmm. New York Times. Um, and otherwise, the Joe Rogan experience, but really when I want to listen to the person in, in particular. Okay. I guess you know about Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan? Yes, I do um, know about him. And he and he sold his exclusive rights just I think earlier this week for 100 million to Spotify. Have you seen this? Yes, I've seen this, and it's crazy. It's it's crazy how how I mean I, I sometimes I question my own knowledge about the space. Like I look at this, and I mean the I I do wonder what the larger strategy of Spotify is behind this because a hundred million dollars. What on earth are they planning to do with this? Right now, you know, they just bought like two years ago, they were, or one and a half years ago, they bought Gimlet for, I think, $250 million. The entire advertising market in the podcast space is, uh, is uh, sized as uh, being 400 million US dollars. What the heck? <laughs> There's something in there that they have. They play some long time. Either they are extremely far, um, like like. Either they know something that uh, nobody else in the space knows, or they are playing a extreme long game, or it's just. Yeah, it's very surprising to me because there are so many great podcasts out there. The Joe Rogan experience is certainly one of the most, uh, the better known ones, but it's not, it's not without competition, and it's not hard to have a similar experience like this. So, what is worth a hundred million dollars about this? It's not even the brand. I'm wondering value. if it's uh, exactly what about, oh, I was about to say. The branding aspect of it. The I suspect that the actual content is worth way less, and that the the majority of the deal is actually bringing listeners over to Spotify by having this branding awareness and you're paying for branding. I don't know, but to appear, for Spotify to appear a little bit like Netflix and Amazon and Disney as a content producer. Yeah, or a content, something, you know, something like, to that too. Like supportive content producers and saying, hey, we also have great content, come over to us. I don't know. Maybe maybe it will prove very useful. We'll see in the in the months or years to come. Um, or maybe they're, they're feeling the heat from Apple, you know, with... Uh, The music subscriptions. So Spotify may be finding itself between a, a rock and a hard place and having to compete. Maybe, maybe. Um, not sure how much input, uh, how much influence um, podcasts have on their music subscription business, though. It's like, a, uh, you know, it, uh, it feel, still feels like two separate use cases. And of course, they can move a podcast in and and put it inside their own walled garden. Basically, you need to have Spotify as a client in order to listen to that podcast. Okay, maybe that's uh, part of the strategy. But then what? Then you're in the Spotify ecosystem. Then what is, are you supposed to do? Is it then that you're supposed to subscribe to the Spotify services and become a premium subscriber? I don't see that happening. I mean, podcasts have been for free and they certainly will not put uh, Joe Rogan behind a, a paywall um, anytime soon. So um, why would that happen? And how how much listen, how much time do you need in terms of uh, ad listening time until you recouped a hundred million dollars? Yeah, agreed. <laughs> I'm very surprised. I was shocked. I read the uh... The New York Times article on the topic. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how the math math work. Indeed. Yeah. If you assume that it's going to bring a hundred thousand listeners or a, a million listeners, you're still about a hundred dollar to a thousand dollar, you know, cost per per acquired customer, potential customer. It's not even a given. I I I don't know. It's interesting, surprising. Yes. Maybe a one off. I don't know. Well. 
whatever maybe or maybe, maybe there is there is further business looming right like selling the 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 the, the rights to other types of media or whatnot uh, i i cannot claim to have any insider knowledge there but i uh, yeah it makes me wonder um but it's certainly guess, good for podcasting, right? It raises an interesting signal. It's like uh, telling people, hey, podcasting is a real thing. It's like something to be reckoned with. It's possible that, I, su I suppose in that case, that Spotify and the like for any streaming business is not going to go bankrupt anytime soon. You know what I'm doing. Have you seized what I'm doing? No. No. I've lost you. You're still in our little debate. No, 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 Before no. I, I was, I was seeing if my keyboard actually works because uh, the recording window froze. So I didn't look at your window for a second. What did you do? No, I didn't do anything specific. I was, oh, oh, what I'm doing in the sense, what I'm doing by saying Spotify is not going to go bankrupt anytime soon if they can spend a hundred million. Now you're paying now, attention. Well, so they are not going to need any subsidies, right, from the government. Well, I'm not sure they would get any for the. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many startups would actually get uh, or high growth companies would get a lot of money from, from the state. The reason why I made that horrible <laughs> forced transition. transition is because our debate today is about companies getting uh, bailouts, being bailed out, basically yeah. getting money from the state, getting money from taxpayers, getting money from us woohoo, to be able to survive. But the way we're connecting this is to climate change. Specifically, the debate, the motion today is about the following topic. Only save companies from bankruptcy if they are committing to reduction of carbon emissions. What made you come up with that topic is, once again, you're the bright light, the bright mind who came up with an interesting debate to talk about. I know you're going to lose, but that's not the point. The point is you you, you suggested the topic, which, which makes me wonder why are you bringing a topic which is interesting, but you're going to lose on. <laughs> that's what you claim all the time so that doesn't bother me um i do think it's timely right it's uh we we are we are um we are taking money in in really monstrous amounts and throw it into the economy because we we are facing an economical crisis and we need to make sure that people are not that we that we are able to restart our economy at some point so there's a lot of money flowing and as governments we uh, our governments have a duty to invest that money wisely and it's easy to forget over corona and unemployment rates and whatnot but we already have a threatening massive crisis in our hands even people even if not everybody realizes it and that's the climate crisis some people start calling it the climate catastrophe. Uh, the, and the summer this, this year, um, in most countries, uh, the summer is projected to become yet another hottest summer in recorded history. And uh, we, we will face more and more problems around this. Now, when you spend trillions of dollars, I do think questions need to be asked. What we spend this money on and who is worth being invested in and who isn't and under what conditions are we willing to, to bail out whole, whole industries that we know need to change for something like uh, the addressing climate, the climate crisis as well. So that is basically the train of thought I was on when I suggested that topic. And I do think it's also a timely conversation right now. It's like uh, something that is being discussed uh, uh, quite a bit. Let's do it. Let's hear you out. You got your two minutes. Let's hear your real arguments. And then I'll have my little time. So, oh, by the way, as usual, we flipped a coin and you'll be in favor of the motion, which is only safe companies if they are committing to reducing their carbon emissions. So that applies to any any industry. I'm not making it specific. Go ahead with your two minutes. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues for the motion. Getting out of the corona-inflicted economic crisis will take trillions of dollars. And our governments are ready to spend this. Our governments already spend money in unprecedented amounts. I mentioned that uh, earlier in the introduction. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I heard in very quick succession two interesting statements 
number one came from a debate in the U.S. Senate, I think, where some angry Republican shouted into a microphone, really, you want to tie economic help to lowering the carbon footprint? Do you really think now is the time? So he was angry about a democratic uh, discussion, of course, uh, a discussion triggered by the Democrats who wanted to have some form of CO2 emission lowering written into the conditions under which you get uh, money from the government. And at the same time, Uh, the news made the round that uh, France decided to bail out Air France. Um, you know, all the airlines are basically grounded these days. They lose an eye-watering amount of money every single day they are grounded. Yet they, we know that they need to change how they operate. They are one of the largest emitters of uh, CO2. They are a cause of a lot of travel-related emissions. Um, not only them, the car industry, the same thing. Here in Germany, the car industry is a huge deal and discussion is around that. So France made a step forward and basically uh, Air France is being bailed out under the condition of allowing the French government to to regulate them um, and um, under the condition that they increase their green policy substantially and the same thing is kind of looming over Lufthansa and I do think this is an interesting combination we face this this uh, massive crisis called the climate catastrophe or climate crisis and it has uh, it touches similar sectors as our current corona inflicted crisis now we have an obligation to spend our money wisely and if we can kill two birds with one stone addressing two crises which we know will cost us trillions we might as well do it in one move and now on to sebastian let's hear his argument The economy is going so bad, so bad, that the least of our concerns right now, the least of our concerns is climate change. We can always come back to climate change and what to do about it later. Yes, I know later is the bad word here because the planet cannot wait. I am conscious of that. I am not denying, obviously, the effects of global warming or that even global warming is happening. But we are already somewhat doomed. The temperature will keep increasing. Even if we were to stop uh, a lot of the carbon emissions today, it's too late. I'm not saying it's a reason to give up. It's just that anything we can do, obviously, from now onwards will help alleviate some of the consequences of that. But we're already doomed. Basically, we can always, the, the best thing we can do is indeed start working on this, on this problem as quickly as possible, not because we'll solve it, but because we'll make it less worse. So totally agreed on that, but it's not the time to focus on at the moment. We need to compromise. What we're experiencing right now from the perspective of many people and experts alike is a once in a century catastrophe. I get it. Climate change is also once in a lifetime or one in a human existence catastrophe. It's just we are not capable of handling more than one massive crisis at a time. We're not even solving the current crisis, which is killing people right away. Climate change will kill people, but not right away maybe in the decades to come, but not right away. If I'm cynical also, I'm completely changing gears before coming back to the main point. But if I'm completely cynical here, companies even forced to supposedly reduce their carbon emissions will find workarounds. They'll buy subsidiaries, which are focusing on it. They'll find whatever strategy uh, is required to not actually have to commit to it, even though on paper it looks like it. Will Air France really be fined if it does not respect the carbon emissions uh, limits? I don't think so. It's owned by the partially by the Dutch state and by the French state. So, you know, even if you have conditions, you know, to what extent it can be enforced, I don't really believe that. Um, I have more things to say. One more thing, maybe uh, I'm out of time. We can also hope that things will improve naturally. I know hope is not a strategy, but let's, let, let's face it. The airline industry, you mentioned it, will not fully recover before a few years which means we don't really wor need to worry too much about airline emissions. I know it's a small fraction today, but it was bound to become a huge fraction of the total carbon emissions. It's no longer going, going to be the case for at least a few years. So we've bought some time because of the current catastrophe. Overall, no need to worry about carbon emissions at the moment because we have much bigger problems to solve in the very short term. Now, it's Dirk's turn. 
Let's hear his rebuttal. You know, about half a year ago, when people were debating what is necessary to address the looming climate crisis, arguments have been made that it's not really possible to change in the speed that is required because changing would require a complete shutdown in some industries and would disrupt markets and disrupt supply chains, all that. Guess what? Corona just did that for us. Now, right now, Industries have came, um, did come to a halt. We are all grounded at home uh, to various degrees. Transportation is stopped at this moment. And at some point, we try to restart. It's much easier, cheaper and useful to set the stage now for the behaviors we need to see when addressing the next crisis. So putting things in motion right now is probably even cheaper than getting everything up and running like it was before and then trying to address climate change. I would say this can go hand in hand. This can go in one move. To give you a metaphor, if you're in a room that has smoke in the air, you're not bothered by, by opening the window first. You probably want to uh, address that your house is maybe on fire. And uh, both of these concerns, oh, there's smoke in the air and uh, oh, it's maybe hot in here, <laughs> can be addressed at the same time by trying to put the fire out. And we are at the same, same moment right now. We have two crises, granted, but they are not coming one after the other. They are happening at the same time. People are already already dying due to the, the climate crisis and people are dying due to corona and we need to address it with massive unprecedented amounts of money. After we have spent that crazy amount of money, the next argument to be made will be, oh, we now spend trillions of, money, uh, of dollars. We cannot spend potentially more trillions of dollars for the climate crisis. Uh, so that is a risk that we face then going further down. We might as well just invest it right now, both in the, in the industries to come and Mind you, it is painful for many industries, but it, it's better painful one time instead of two times. And we are already late addressing climate crisis, as you put yourself. Like uh, we, we will already struggle making ground as we speak. Why not uh, freeing up that money? We have in Europe something called the Green Deal. Uh, to some degree, that's even, you know, it's like an investment program that could even lead to prosperity. Why not combining the Green Deal with the Corona, uh, uh, the corona subsidies and bailouts and make sure that we we support the programs and the industries that are good for climate and we demand from industries that come to us and want to have taxpayer monies. We demand from them that they not only think about the short-term corona crisis but also help addressing the long-term catastrophe that is the crisis we have around the global climate. <laughs> Next up, Sebastian. So you mentioned we can handle multiple things at the same time. You mentioned we can kill two birds with one stone. I want to provide one example to show you that even something which may be easier to solve, maybe, I don't know, uh, than climate change is even, is even too much to handle at the moment. And that example, and it's also completely unrelated, but related to lockdowns, is domestic violence. Domestic violence by different accounts, has doubled or tripled during the, lock the lockdown period. It, was, it used to be a big problem. It still is a problem, but it's not addressed anymore because people have lost jobs by the millions. So it's kind of a problem which is a real problem of society, which is being ignored. I think it's also an example of a problem that needs to be addressed very quickly, by the way, and again, more probably more quickly than climate change. I feel sad to read these news. What can I do about it? I don't really know. It's in the press. It's out there. Right? In some countries, we're talking about a triple in terms of official reports and, and calls of women most often being you know, physically abused by their spouses or partners at home. So I don't think we're capable of handling anything at, at every, multiple things, especially big problems, massive problems at once. Even the current crisis it was a disaster in terms of management, uh, crisis management by most governments. Now, maybe Germany, Switzerland, Austria... Where role models, maybe Taiwan, but the vast majority of the countries were late to the game. They had information, just like we have information about climate change, and yet nothing happened. Look at the US, look at the UK, look at France. It's been a disaster. So I have no confidence whatsoever in being able to properly address multiple crises at, at once. Again, not to say we should not address climate change, but I think there's a time 
to do things one after the other. And let's go back to the original uh, de debate motion, which is, should we put conditions on the companies which are about to be bankrupt for them to reduce carbon emissions? We're not talking about governments, we're talking about the actual companies. But here are the things. There's many other conditions we could use for bailing out companies. For example, and that has been used in some cases, is about preserving jobs or forcing companies to invest in modernizing infrastructure because it's a, a debt that can be more useful in terms of improving whatever vehicles, planes, airports, whatever it is that we need to bail out because it will be an investment for the future as opposed to paying salaries, which basically go nowhere because people are saving up money. How many jobs were lost in the US in the past three months? 40 million. I mean, we've never seen this ever, right? And there have been schemes, and as you mentioned rightfully, trillions of dollars going into the economy. And despite that, 40 million people have filed for unemployment for the first time out of how many people in the US who actually are usually working? 150 million, give or take. It's about almost 30%. I, I really think the first priority is ensuring these companies preserve jobs. They cannot focus on multiple things at once. You mentioned very rightfully also, the virus situation is a great opportunity to change behaviors or to require people to change behaviors because of the massive drastic change. But let me ask you the, the following question, which is very specific and more of a rhetorical question. There's all this debate about public transportation, right? And whether it's safe to take public transportation until you have a vaccine. And people are saying, well, we need individual cars. But guess what? If you're poor or the average human being on this planet, you don't have money to buy a Tesla. You don't have money to buy an electric car. So yeah, your choice is basically being between buying a, a bicycle, which has seen a surge in sales, but it's not realistic for people with kids. And I don't have kids, but I can totally consider that doing groceries on a bicycle with three kids is not doable uh, or going to work. If you have to go uh, across town um, to actually go to work if it's several kilometers and you're living in a country where it's too cold or too hot or whatever. What that means is that you're probably going to buy a diesel car right, or a petrol car because it's cheaper still today, which means it's not very environmentally friendly. So what are you going to do with the car companies which require to be bailed out, which is the case at the moment? Are you telling them you can only sell electric cars, but then they're going to sell them for $30,000, which nobody can afford? So that's why I don't think we need any more condition. Uh, beyond maybe preserving jobs or any other condition not related to climate change. Final statements. Dirk goes first. If my money, my taxpayer money that is, is being spent, I feel I have a right to um, influence what it's spent on. Your example. Why is it that the diesel car is still cheaper than the freaking electric car? All major car manufacturers have hybrid and electric cars. And the combustion engine is still cheaper because they want to sell those. Because they already have plenty of those. Because it costs money to change factories. All of these reasons. I would make it a condition that they, they invest the money I give them to bail out into changing their damn factories. And I do think that's a fair condition to make. And that's just one example of many. Other examples, uh, if if a, a city is getting money to help them with infrastructure, I would make it a condition that they make sure that the healthcare system is improved and that the public transportation is improved. That's the condition coming with accepting public money. If you don't, uh, if you're not willing to accept this, well, then maybe you don't need the bailout. And I would go as far as to say there are industries we can actually live without. If there is a tabac uh, a tabac company or uh, uh, some certain other other factor that go out of business right now, I don't I wouldn't even bother giving them a bailout, even if that means a few people uh, take a little bit longer until they get a new job, because there are painful changes happening right now, and I do feel uh, those changes are better done in one move instead of uh, splitting them up in two. It's better to have one moment of being in pain than two moments of being in pain. And that's my final argument. Uh, yes, we should we should put uh, bailouts. Uh, we should combine bailout with strong conditions to be more uh, carbon neutral, CO two friendly, uh, environmental friendly. You name it. Sebastian, I'd love for you to be right. I'd love for this to happen. I I mean it. I, I'd love for this scenario to be realistic, and I'm worried that it's not, that it's not realistic 
And the reasons being everything I laid out, but mainly centered around the fact that you need to preserve jobs. I, th I think it's difficult and it's difficult for me even to speak right now because I've not been in that situation of losing my job, uh, whether 12 years ago or today, but I can only start to imagine how difficult it must be to think you're on the verge of losing your job. And if you think that your company is firing you because it has more constraints, when the whole point of these bailouts is actually to restart the economy, to kickstart it again and save companies and save jobs. And I agree with you. I'm not here to defend tobacco companies or companies which, for all that I care, could, could die net tomorrow. You know, I feel bad for the employees getting losing their jobs, but I would not care about the industry itself. But that, that aside, if I talk about the airline industry, if I talk about the, uh, the automobile industry, even if I don't own a car, I am sensitive to the fact that if I am the CEO of these companies and I have to make a choice because I have so many constraints, my hands are tied and I have to get rid of an extra thousand jobs because I have these extra constraints here in this debate, I would feel uncomfortable with that. And I do think it's too many strings. It's too many things that these companies, these governments have to handle at the moment. So that's why I'm not in favor of adding extra conditions at the moment. It's too critical a period of time and too uncertain to know whether we'll be able, even be able to recover the economy quickly enough within the next few years. You forced me, you pushed me to my boundaries. I didn't think I would be so adamant. Now I've convinced myself. <laughs> I didn't think I had strong enough arguments, but you provoke me. I'm going to fight you. Yeah, that's fair good enough. I like it. I, I mean, we, we, are, we are out of time for debating now, but I, the counter argument to what you just said obviously is well, without bailout, all of those employees are on the street. With the bailout, less employees. Uh, there are more people being in employment with the bailout. We are not talking about, oh, the company has to let more people go because of the constraints of the bailout. We are actually talking about, oh, they go bankrupt and everybody is out. Or they don't go bankrupt, but they have to accept a few conditions on this. So that's like, uh, you, you, you pulled an unfair trick here to make your point stronger. Uh, but it's like, I, I, I don't think that those, uh, those two are, um, are uh, contradictory, mutually exclusive. That's what I wanted to say. Why do you say it's unfair? I think it's an extra condition, an extra burden. You're adding an extra condition it makes it more difficult. They have that condition it's, already. It's not it's about a... bailout or no bailout. It's about bailout with conditions. And yeah. I'm saying if the condition is preserve your jobs, that's already one condition. If you're saying modernize your infrastructure, it's another condition. If you're saying reduce your carbon emissions, it's a third on top of that. And I'm saying basically that one condition of preserving jobs is already so hard and difficult enough that that... I, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm naive on on that front, but I, I from what I'm reading, it feels it's already like some some companies are refusing the bailout money because they can't even they can't even maybe I should have said that because they can't even promise to to keep the jobs. So make me makes no sense to keep the jobs for four months because anyway they're going to close down so or or, or or diminish their activities. Let me let me let me give you a, a much easier to to. Um to grasp example, let's say my son comes to me and says, "Dad, I'm 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 studying. I'm I'm at risk of be dropping out of school because I cannot afford a computer." Yeah, and then I I open up my wallet and I'm giving him money and I say, "Okay, here is money, but I g I give you this money under the condition you buy a computer that is uh, good enough." So you're not coming back to me in two years or three years. You're buying a computer with this money that is good enough so you can stay in your university and complete your degree. Is that an unfair demand to make? Of course, I give him the money and he's under pressure already. He may also want to spend some money on food and whatnot, but I'm giving him my money under the condition that he spends it in a certain way. And that way he kind of, uh, he basically gets what he wants, but he also has to comply with the rules. I'm buying something. And the same is Dear, right now Dear. true for governments. They buy something. I, I think the, the more correct analogy, and correct me if you disagree, uh, is not I that disagree. you're actually paying, paying for the for the equipment. Is that your let's say your computer costs a minimum of let's say two hundred dollars, right? Like the the cheapest possible Chromebook. What you're actually doing, I think the analogy is you're giving fifty dollars, and you're saying do what you can with that. This is what the governments are doing at the moment. They're not giving the full amount to do everything and make the industry survive for multiple years. They're giving short term 
loans or grants to be able to survive a few months. It's not the full amount but that, the, a, that the company needs. It's a negotiation moment. And your son would say, your son would say, uh, all right, with $50, I can go, you know, only so much. I can do only so much. And maybe I refuse the $50 because I'd rather not take it and give it back the money to you because I cannot afford the rest anyway. Fair That's enough. what's happening. Fair enough. Um, the, the point, though, is, you know, before Corona, the negotiation we would have with uh, like car makers or airlines is like, oh, we cannot do those changes because you know that's hard on our uh, on our our uh, earnings and we have we will have to lay off people and it's too too hard right now. And right now we have a different negotiation situation. They basically say, oh, we're not making any money at all. Please help us. We tell us, oh, on that note, didn't we talk recently about how <laughs> how you can change things? And you told us it, you cannot do it because true. it's fair. I mean, all right, it's fair. But yeah, at the yeah. same time, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have have changed, and things that even government said government said they would not do are doing. Right? in terms of granting this money and and bailout re re or recovery or rescue funds, so everyone's doing and changing their behavior. At all levels, right? So it's not just companies; it's also governments because it's just so severe. But you, it's a fair point, you know. Of course, the the lobbyists will always try to find a way to go around regulation or demands or negotiations. It's fair. I, again, I don't disagree with you. In principle, I completely agree with you. I just don't think it's realistic. I just don't think it's it's the right timing, and I don't think that anyone will will. And cynically, I don't even think it, it will change anything. But you're less cynical than me. You're, no, you're more of a I, dreamer. Um, unfortunately, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, our debate was over, should we demand uh, contestants? And I'm, uh, I am I think we definitely should. And it, com it comes down to a very simple fact. If I'm, if I'm spending money on something, I feel I have a right to demand a few things. I have a right to buy something. And as a taxpayer... It's not my only concern that everybody is uh, in employment. It's also my concern, will my children and my children's children survive? That's also something that's of concern. And so if we have the opportunity to invest money in the both, I think we have a obligation to do so. Um, now, you brought you brought the example of the, the US system where people are uh, out of employment in the millions. And honestly, we have most of our listeners actually come from the US. And from a European perspective, this is bonkers. I totally understand when people say, oh, I don't know how to pay my rent and I'm out of healthcare because my healthcare is tied to my employment. Uh, I have bigger fish to fry than thinking about the weather in 20 years. Fair enough, I understand that position, but it's also incredibly short-sighted because in 20 years, you're going to be desperate for something to be mad on about the weather. And honestly, the system in the US is a really, really bad example to start with because except for the developing countries of this planet, it's nowhere as bad as in the US because the US actually has a system based on the fact that nothing, as long as uh, nothing nothing goes wrong, then people with money stay healthy. That's basically the, the system. <laughs> and everybody else is screwed as soon as something goes down. And uh, the, the system is, is just, I mean... They should invest their money in changing their system. Honestly, like not the the they should Agreed. rethink how they govern their 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 country. They should rethink how they invest in public infrastructure. All of this is uh, what they should put the money into. But that's not that's beyond our current debate. Let's say. I agreed, and uh, you mentioned about you want to have a choice of where the taxpayer your money is going. At the end of the day, it will be you know the the basis of a democratic system. I am not convinced. That, that you we would have a majority for what you and I both agree that it is worth investing in modernizing infrastructure, making it carbon friendly, etc. If if the equation and maybe it's too simplistic, or the dilemma is as follows: option A, I guess it's the it's the it's the blue pill. <laughs> the blue pill is you know with the money we can save a thousand jobs, but your grandchildren will have no jobs and they're going to suffer from more diseases and global warming, or Today you have 500 people who have a job, 500 people without a job, and they're gonna and they're gonna suffer for real. Like people are suffering today, very very likely. I don't know anyone because I'm privileged. Um, but at least your grandchildren, if you have any, if you're still alive and to have grandchildren, despite the uh, the recession, will enjoy a better world. And that's maybe the the red pill, the second option. But I am not convinced you'll get the majority on the second option. 
because people are indeed like we are very emotional driven we are very short term driven and i am not convinced so that was i think you know at the underlying i think debate that we did not cover because that was not the point today but i think that's what's underlying and anyway there we agree. interesting i love the love the the discussion thanks for bringing this up thank you for debating with me as always uh, i enjoyed it a lot um, and i think at the core problem we agree Like the, what you just I described, so. I, I'm yes. totally, I'm totally uh, aligned with that. Uh, of course, of course, we will opt for the short-term thing. Of course, we will try to help as many people right now as possible. I only hope that there, there is overlap, right? There is overlap where you can do both, and I hope that we are not, not so stupid to miss those opportunities. So there is, for better or worse, we will come out of this crisis with more people being being trained in remote work and having more infrastructure around this. We will have opportunities to save travel in the future. We will have uh, maybe a, a, some industries that are struggling right now, maybe even better off changing to some more eco-friendly uh, alternatives or we're on the brink of that anyway, right? All of this um, I keep my fingers crossed for this and I hope that some of this is actually helping us coming out on top of it. Um, I, I mean, there's another debate uh, waiting to happen. We could we could debate whether or not it would be worth to to um, raise our debt levels to crazy amounts in order to save for climate as well. Like, what what if all the states agree on on putting pumping another 20 trillion dollars into the economy to do to save the other problem as well that would be an interesting debate to have because right now you know the conservatives around the globe right now swallow the bitter pill that they the, yes sometimes it is the right thing to do to be a strong government and put money into into the system no austerity politics these days and it would be really really interesting to debate if that is maybe a path forward for a couple of more years to come like going crazy over this and then at some point just say okay we drop all the debts equally and then restart everything but anyway you're we are out of time thanks for debating uh, our listeners if you feel strong about one side or the other let us know uh, you can go to the page and vote you can drop us an email at mail at to debate.eu um, and uh, or or find us on Twitter. We are both actually available online on all the usual outlets. Any final words, Sebastian, to say? No final few words, Derek. I'm all good, and I look forward to our next debate. Stay Thank healthy. You. Bye bye. All right. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>